now like to rewind back because you you may not know but you you're something you are a pioneer sir you're you're a pioneer i say that because you are also part of the shooting stars team which became the first team in nigeria to win a continental title and you had an excellent coach as then uh, coach as well then alan hawks what was the plan then when Alan Hawks came to Shooting Stars back then? Well, you said it yourself. Um, we were pioneers. Nobody had won anything in Nigeria at the time. Uh, very few teams. I don't know. You know. We've had a few experiences of foreign coaches in Nigeria. But at club level, that was the first time Shooting Stars would have a foreigner. I don't know of any other team that had a white man. But a British coach in Nigeria, I think that was the first time. And I'm not sure if we've had one since then. And British football was the in thing, you know, at that time. That was what you saw once every week, match of the week on television. <laughs> that was the only thing you saw. That's what you read in Shoot magazine and all the other magazines. So to have a young, white, British coach even though he had no records of any sort of having coached anybody before, but coming from the UK to come and coach us, again, you know, instilled some level of confidence that we didn't have. You know, we were, you know, soaking on his every word. We were like sponges. Once he opened his mouth, it was the holy grail we were hearing. Mm. So he did that for us. And together in 1976, it was like a joke. You know, I was just graduating from school. I was, in fact, in school through most of it. And um, yeah, so we we won the Africa Cup Winners' Cup. And the, it was an eye opener for everybody in Nigeria. The possibility that such a thing could be done. And lo and behold, the following year, Rangers did exactly the same thing. And it took a couple of years again before Shooting Stars again won the Confederations Cup. And then BCC won the Cup winners and so on and so forth. Uh, up to these days when, well, any team can win with a good set of players. So, but that was the foundation. That was the first time we were the pioneers. We opened the floodgates. We opened them physically and psychologically. And uh, we reaped some benefits from it because it was from that victory that I got my first car, I bought my first car, I bought my first piece of land, I, I became a distributor of cement, of all <laughs> kinds of things, <laughs> you know. So it opened up opportunities for us. The following year, even when we did not win the cup, we were given a car each for getting to the semi-finals. Epic semi-final against Rangers, I, I, I must add. Yes, against Rangers. For how we played, for the manner we represented the club and the state and the Yoruba race at the time. The governor, um, uh, Brigadier General David J.B. Boyenwa at the time, who had bought cars already, had ordered for cars already because he believed that we were going to win the cup again still went ahead to donate those cars to us. You know, so it was good. It was good. Now, we, earlier on we spoke about Nations Cup and all that, and obviously there was, you know, there's been a bit of pain regarding the World Cup, and you never playing there, even though we, you know, Nigeria had a very good team that probably would have, you know, represented us. But do you still have any regrets or all that is in the past, that you never graced the greatest show on earth? Regret that word does not apply. It's not as if I should have gone and didn't go. <laughs> uh, we tried our best to go. We were so close to it. Re recall that at the two times we were so close, last huddle, there was only one country that was representing the continent at the time. It was very, very hard to qualify for the World Cup. And yet in 1977, we only had to draw against Tunisia at home for us to be at the 1978 World Cup, we lost at home. In 1981, we only needed to defeat Algeria on home soil. Again, we lost at home. So we went so very, very far, at least in Africa. We did our best to go, but it didn't happen. 
probably that would have been a turning point, not just in our own lives, but in the story of Nigerian football. Had we gone to either of those two World Cups, because we had in 77 a very, very good squad that could have you know, done Africa proud and represented us very well. In 1981, we had young boys coming up then, uh, Stephen Keshi, Franklin Howard, uh, Henry Musu, uh, Rashidi, Rashidi Yekini was just on the periphery, uh, goalkeeper, Peter Rufai, all of those guys to team up with the remnants of the 1980 team would have been a truly terrific team going to the 1982 World Cup. But it didn't happen on home soil, so we couldn't do anything. It was a big disappointment. But it didn't happen. So no regrets, but a disappointment. The likes of the late Stephen Keshi became a pioneer in terms of players going abroad to play professional football. Could you please tell me, how close did you come to playing professional football? In England, and tell, please tell me what exactly happened. No, <laughs> no, 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 no. I can't tell you. Yes, I came. I left Nigeria um, to come for trials with you know a team that was very, very popular in London, then Tottenham Hotspur, okay. and it had uh, Adiles and the rest of them. And I got to London, went to my friend's place. Tunde Fagben Lee, and I was supposed to now report a day or two after. <laughs> but, you know, one thing led to the other. Um, one, you know, <laughs> I didn't have, we, we didn't have a history of people coming to play here. Um, even though decades before them, Tonda Balogun and so on had played, but that was very quiet, nobody knew. And um, we were doing well in Nigeria, you know, the, even though we were not professionals. But I was doing well. In fact, I, let me talk about myself. I was doing very well, you know. And um, so the urge, really, to turn pro was not there. The confidence that is required, you know, to come and that you could play here was not there. So late Kojo Alakija, who was team manager of the Super Eagles, who made all the arrangements for me to come, you know, did not even press me to go and all of that. So I just came and had fun and enjoyed myself here. You enjoyed the bright lights. <laughs> Don't go into that. And enjoyed myself. <laughs> and uh, before I knew it, I went back to, <laughs> to Nigeria to go to my captaincy of the national team. And, uh, you know, yeah, the local superstar in Nigeria. I wish I had stayed. You know, I wish I had gone for the trials. I wish I had tested it out to even find out for myself, you know, how well I could have played here. Even though, you know, a, sh a few short months later, we came back on a tour of England. We were camping in England, and we played against a few English teams. And uh, I saw that, poof, on the pitches that they had in England, I would have been flying like a, like a bird. You know, imagine the grounds now, and imagine those of us who had speed and skills and all of that playing on the sort of turf. The, the ground they have now, they actually have specialist people, you know, who, who look after the, the hollow turf. Yeah. And even then, there were very good turfs compared to where we were playing, although the Liberty Stadium ground was as good as anyone in Europe, but that was the only stadium in the whole of Nigeria that was of that quality. But I could, I could have played here, I know that. But um, for one reason or the other, I didn't. <laughs> Interesting. Is it fair to say that the success you had in Nigerian football is what has fueled your passion and made you stay in football? Because even up to now, you live and breathe football. No, the football is a big, big industry. The football industry is big. The football industry made me. The game made me. People know me because I played football. And um, it just made sense that 
since there's an industry, it's a global industry, it covers virtually all spheres of human endeavor. Are you talking construction? Are you talking architecture? Are you talking law? Are you talking business? Are you talking tourism? Are you talking uh, facilities manufacture, facilities management? You know, what What are you talking about? It is all encompassed in sports. Or you want to look at the sports media that drives the football game itself. So the field is so wide that um, except you're a lazy person, if you made your name from football, it just makes sense that you use that name to establish in one of the vast and diverse industries in the, in the, in the football business. That's what I have done. I have not tried to go and practice engineering that I studied. You know, so I have remained within uh, the, the realm, within this football business, doing TV production, you know, doing some radio, working in the print, um, setting up an academy, you know, managing a few athletes, writing my own books as an author, doing reportage. I was a reporter, you know, and so on and so forth. So I have done so many things, all related to the football industry. That's my field. As you've rightfully stated, you've had a lot of experience in football from a playing side and from the other side. You have a lot of clout. You've traveled far and wide. Is it a mystery to you that you've never become the NFF chairman? Or would you say it's a blessing in disguise because you're able to give back to football in other ways, like your academy? <laughs> I don't know how to answer that, your question. I know it's loaded. <laughs> Try, please. Uh, uh, no, well, to become NFF president is a political thing. It's not about merit. It's not about who is most competent or knowledgeable, but it is about he who can play the politics. We are all Nigerians and we know it. It is something about geography, about ethnicity, ethnicity about uh, political resources. It is all about those things, not about the content of your football knowledge or experience. You know, so given that new area and territory, I am not vast in it. <laughs> I'm not experienced in it. I'm very naive in that regard. So I did not succeed. And it is nobody's fault. Um, if I knew what I know now about the politics of becoming president of the Nigeria Football Federation. Probably I would have been. But looking back, I think I would not have still done the things that are essential to be done to become president. You know, I would not have had the, the moral uh, guts to have taken my hard-earned money to go and grease the path to becoming president of the NFL. No, I wouldn't do that. Uh, I see the role of president as that of service, not as that of uh, ben some, you know, benefiting from. So, yeah, but that's what Nigerians wanted. That's what they got. They got the person that they wanted. So, and it is all good. You know, it has served us well. Maybe I would have been a terrible president. Who knows? You say that, but let me rewind a little bit. In 2010, I remember, because I was in the BBC studios then. I was working there. And you, you tried to, you know, set up a bid for the 2010 World Cup, which was meant to be a joint bid. Obviously, at the time, you had the vision that it would improve a lot of things across African countries. Looking at the way things are now, things like the Abuja Stadium, which is short, and Nigeria's lack of maintenance, do you feel some of us were right in saying that that's not what Nigeria needs because we can't maintain such a legacy? Well, you didn't do what I wanted us to do then. 
So we did what you wanted us to do. Where are we now? That's my answer. What I wanted, what I proposed, what I sold, what I wanted Nigeria to do, to use the hosting of the 2010 World Cup that was supposed to come to Africa, to use it to kickstart a developmental project that will be the fastest infrastructural development, even political, economic, political development in the whole of West Africa. They thought it was stupid. They thought it was far-fetched. They thought it couldn't be done. So it was not done. It was shut down and replaced by what you people said, you know, uh, should be. Not do anything. So we didn't do it. So where are we now? Are we better off now? than where we would have been had we attempted to do it. I don't know, you know, that's, that is all in the area of conjecture now. So, but I believe that people just don't see what I see. You know, we are all different. We are all wired differently. People don't have the kind of vision that I have, which is unfortunate. I wanted us to host the World Cup in 2010. I have been sh shouting that we should host the World Cup in 2030. You know, we should do a joint West African bid for five countries to host the World Cup. They said it was stupid. Now, <laughs> the whole world is doing it. Even America, the biggest and the richest country in the world, is teaming up with two other countries, the Canada and Mexico, to make up a whole continent to host the World Cup. Five countries in Europe are going to do it. Four, three, four countries in South America are bidding to do it. Everybody is now doing it. What I proposed in 2003 that I sold to Sepp Blatter, I told Sepp Blatter, and he said that was the most brilliant idea he had ever heard for West Africa to come and host it. But my people did not see it. I wanted us, I wanted us to, you know, beat, to be, not beat, I wanted us to, I wanted to become president of FIFA. I wanted to become president of FIFA. I had the qualifications. I have the background, I have the experience, I have the vision, and I come from the right part of the world that was due for it, but oh, they shut it down. But you didn't have the politics, as you said, because you, did, you didn't have it in FF, and trust me, the, the politics they play in FIFA is much more sophisticated than in Nigeria. No, I don't agree with you. I don't agree with you. What we needed was for even our own country to even support our own bid. To support our own man, it did not even take off. The president of my country gave instructions that I should be supported, I should be nominated, and I should be supported. But he is not there to go and see that it is done. It was not done. And we know deliberately, for other pecuniary reasons, it was not done. So, we had. It. I am just far ahead. I'm saying... You know, that to change Nigerian football, if you want Nigerian football to just grow, to become like what you watch in Europe and everything and everything, it does not, it does not require rec uh, rocket science. It is the simplest, it is the cheapest thing to do. We have so much talent that needs to be showcased. Where do you showcase them? We don't have grounds where they can even play. That's all we need to provide. Provide them with excellent playing tough. Let them play it. The world will come to cover it. The world will come to watch and see how our boys play. They don't come now to come and watch. Well, maybe we needed to start at the beginning because obviously we can see the state of our leagues now. They're barely functioning. Yes, now. The leagues are not attractive. If you go to the stadium, you can hardly see four or five passes strung together because the pitches are not good. We are either playing on artificial turf or we are playing on horse racing tracks and that kind of thing. So you can't see good football. So even if you put television to cover those matches, they will be so unattractive that nobody will watch. It will do more damage than good, even if you put those poor matches on TV. So what you need to do is put do good matches first. And the good matches have to be played on a good turf. Just put, let the turf be good. Once the turf is good, our boys will start to express themselves. Now they need to come out to Europe to express themselves. They need to go to the Under-17 World Cup 
to express themselves. They need to go to under 23 World Cup. That's where they find the surface. It's just the surface. They find the surface to express themselves. That's where they are discovered. You don't discover them on the top of Nigeria. Because you can't. It is a very simple thing. And it is a question of which comes first, the chicken or the egg. You understand? Mm. Uh -huh. And now we are telling them, let's face that simple one that we can do. The simple one that we can do. We had it before in Liberty Stadium. We had it before at the National Stadium. We had it before at... USC. at the Ab uh, No, USC didn't have it. And in the Abuja National Stadium. Brazil came to play in Abuja. Brazil. So the question I have for you, because obviously the Abuja Stadium is the legacy of the 2003 All-African Games. Stadium shot. There's nothing happening there. It's Dead. Disgrace. It's a disgrace. And all of us should just hide our faces in shame. Because there's no reason why it should be so. There's no reason. It's not as if we had a fire disaster or there was an earthquake or there was... It was just inability to manage a facility. That was all. That's it. An edifice that we all should be proud of. An edifice that should be a tourist destination for us. Now it is just there. A carcass. Nobody goes there. Nothing happens there. But fortunately, the new minister has moved there. And I hope that his presence will take, start taking people there. Maybe they will pay attention and fix it or not. Some will say the stadium was built there on political grounds. And some will argue that Lagos will always be the spiritual capital of football in Nigeria. What's happened to that stadium in Nigeria? And why did they not continue the great tradition of playing games there? You have countries like Italy who don't necessarily play their games in Rome. It's rotated, played in other stadiums. What has happened to the national stadium, our treasure? I don't know. You should ask. You should ask them. I don't work in the ministry. I don't. So I don't have your answer. I went to Perugia in Italy to go and watch uh, uh, the Italian national team play against Georgia during the World Cup. Some several years ago. You are absolutely right. You don't have to play in Rome. You know, Italy doesn't have to play in Rome. They can have it. We used to play in, they've played in Nibado, Liberty Stadium ground. The national team had played there. The national team had played in Kaduna because those turfs were fantastic. Pele came and played in Nigeria. Queen's Park Rangers came and played in Nigeria. So many foreign teams, Borussia, uh, uh, Gladbach. They came to play in Nigeria. Now, no team wants to come to play in Nigeria because you don't have even one single stadium surface that is good enough to allow for these guys to come and play. So does that not buttress, you know, people's point about wanting to host a large, a big tournament? And yet, the simple thing we need to do to budget every year, we don't have a culture of maintenance in Nigeria. You don't do things on your own. You are forced to do them. Don't climb that wall. That's when you will see Nigerians. But you shouldn't, they shouldn't have to be forcing you. It should yeah. come as common. Take, for instance, the Lagos Ibado Expressway. They let it get to a state where, you know, it was practically unfit for purpose. Whereas every year, there should have been a budget to maintain the road, the little cracks here and there. That's what should happen. How do we change this culture of lack of, you know, maintenance in all our structures? Well, you stop being Nigerians. <laughs> that's going to be difficult. Uh -huh. So, you know, that's who we are. That's in our DNA. You know, um, we are the product of our environment. We are the product of our history. Where are we coming from? Who really are we? What you see of Nigeria is reflective of who we really are. We are a loud, proud, very well endowed, well blessed people, but that do not have an appreciation of themselves. You know, if we appreciate who we are, you know, the largest black population on earth with a very deep and rich history, which is still visible and measurable in our culture and in the institutions that are back home that represent our, our roots, if we really know who we are, 
we wouldn't be where we are now. We would be, you know, in the forefront of development in the world, in all spheres. We'd be leading the world. That's who we really are. We, as black people, go, go, go through history and find out why the black man was subjugated, why we are still oppressed up to now, why this present system is not designed so that the black man will succeed at anything. It's not designed so that we succeed. Why are we not loved? Well, it is all embedded in who we were before, our greatness before, which can come to be if they don't stop us and if we are not foolish and stupid enough to fall victim of all their machinations and all the things they introduce to us as good and all our own bad. And so we abandon our culture, abandon who we are, abandon our religion, abandon our language, abandon everything, and now go and embrace that one that is not designed so that we can flourish. It is stupidity. But <laughs> that's where we are. So I hope that generations to come, our children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren would see what I've just said now and do something about it to reposition themselves, not to enslave themselves again, physically and mentally, and you know to free themselves from the bondage that we are in, and to look around their environment. You know, we are so, we are so blessed. If my classmate of mine was telling me about the city where I grew up in, in Jos, which had, at that time, the largest reserves of tin ore and columbite in the whole world. And the climate of that environment is one of the best in the whole world. Go there up till now. Look at the flora and the fauna. Look at the environment, the beauty of it. The weather is fantastic. Whites used to just go there, white people, expatriates. They loved it there. My friend was telling me that buried under the ground of that environment, it's a plateau. Are these rocks that ring the whole place buried under it? He is a mineralogist. Are gems, are rare minerals, are all kinds of. He says, Look, that place should be the California of Africa in terms of business and people and money and economy. And that place should be the best place to live and work and do business and do whatever you want to do in the whole world. Say we are just sitting atop it and we are killing each other. Nobody is doing anything. People are still coming to just loot the whole minerals and take them away. And they make your phones from them. They make your laptops from them. And the women in, you know, we are all the, all the sapphires and all the gems and everything. They are all there. So they take all our minerals, they convert them, and then sell them back to us at exorbitant prices. We are stupid people. Jeez. We are stupid people. We have oil. We set up refineries to, 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 to use our crude oil to, 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 to turn them into what we can use, what we can sell. We destroy the refineries, and then we now take our crude oil, half of which is not <coughs> recorded. We take them abroad, and then we now bring them back in finished products at a higher cost than the crude oil we are sending out. We are just these stupid people. We are just these stupid people, and that's how we. I'm not, you know, it is frustrating. It is frustrating, truly frustrating, because any aspect of our lives that you look at, you see that they are all reflected in who we are, the least of which is sports, is football. You see, even despite the ill treatment we have meted to ourselves and to even the game itself, you still see those rare uh, gems. They are still coming through. It's not planned. It's not as if we develop them. It's not as if they are just coming through. Now, it's even worse or it's better because out of the products of those that have left the country before, are living abroad now, you know, we find their children are coming up, still with our DNA, still have speed and skills and power and all of that. 
shining in Europe and we are now taking them to begging them to come and represent our country. That's what we are doing now. I believe Dominic Ayofa's son plays here. Well, you see, that's what I'm saying. So they are all trained abroad now and then we beg them to come back to play for us when we could have a production line, endless production line of great footballers just coming out of Nigeria to dominate the world and to show the world what Rangers showed Nigeria in 1970 when they came out of the civil war, a defeated army, but they came out and in less than two years they were leading all the football tournaments everywhere. Nobody was thinking of war anymore. It was Rangers, Rangers, Rangers. You know, go Rangers. You see? So we could have done that. We could have used the gifts that we have even in football to project our country in such a way that we will start to be respected around the world. Through football, through music, through the arts, through we can start a repositioning process. We had first stack in 1977, which was monumental, still being talked about. We go on YouTube, we still see some of the shows. And obviously you were a beneficiary of that because you were awarded a house from first stack. That was the legacy. Yeah, that's what we should be doing every year in Nigeria. That's the vision I have. The Black Festival of Arts and Culture, which is a project that celebrates black arts and culture that celebrates the black man that brings all black people around the world one family together to come and discuss their destiny because their destiny is one they are they are jointly oppressed and suppressed and subjugated and enslaved in the world that would have been a perfect platform every year to sit and celebrate in the name of arts and culture shape a direction for us we started it they shut it down they said it was fetish this was this this was that and blah 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 never done again and here we are the most divided race in the world who this is where we are going to end who i've thought about it who what country what people love you nigerians in the whole world i've been everywhere as individuals, they love you. They love your industry. They love your spirit of adventure. They love your spirit of hard work. They love your, 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 your loudness, your, how you celebrate. You lavish with your festivals and all of that. They love those things as individuals. You have brainy people. They are in NASA. They are in, they are in Silicon Valley. They are everywhere. They are doing great things. But as a community, who loves you? Who loves you? Name one country, whether black or white or green or colored, that will come at us. Oh, we love Nigerians. That is where we are. That is how bad the situation is. That is how bad our situation is. And we should start, sit back and start to think, rethink, not for self this time, but for the whole, for the whole community of black people on earth. We are the largest population, concentration of black people, until we succeed, until we re no, we realize where we are, until we realize our importance in driving the course of the black man on earth. We are finished as a race. I don't know where we are going. Rudderless. We are just acting in isolation. There is no cohesion. There's no no plan. plan. There's no vision. There's no mission. There's nothing. Thank you. A pleasure, sir. Thank you.